Okay, so I'm very happy to introduce to you Lucia, who of course you all know from, from seeing her and I was just asking the last question today. She's well known to many of, of you already. She's, Lucia's been a member of the PIM Society since 2013. She's half Italian and she's recently been having weekly Zoom lessons with an Italian teacher who's also called Lucia and that's for about the last year, Lucia. Um, she's a civil servant and a long-term member also of the Trollope Society and she's been part of our committee and and she, we're very grateful to her, especially this year, because it was Lucia who set up the Eventbrite account that's enabled us to even be here at this conference. So thank you very much for that. And she's also our Twitter handle on the account as well. She's, she's an avid traveller. And last year, she went to Rome to recreate the St Basil's trip in unsuitable attachment. And she's recently returned from Greece. And about three years ago, she delighted us with her talk, which was recreated from the recipes from Barbara's novels using contemporary recipes. So we had semolina pudding and chicken smothered with the inevitable white sauce. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to hearing what she's prepared for us today. Lucia Costanza. Thank you very much. Um, I must apologise in advance. I've got a bit of a cold, so I have water down there. So hopefully um, I won't get too spluttery. Okay. We were talking about the trip to Rome after Easter, said Sophia, pouring out a cup of stewed tea for Mark. Edwin is hoping to be able to come. And of course, Daisy will. How many are going, asked Edwin. Surely not the whole parish. No, regular communicants only, if you see what I mean, said Sophia. That is our own friends and people who really do come to church regularly. Of course, that means Sister Jew and Ianthe Broom. Her face brightened as she saw herself walking down the Spanish steps with Ianthe. How did the idea originate, Edwin asked. Oh, it was one of Mark's sermons, in a sense. He said something like, those of you who are familiar with the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, and it turned out that hardly anybody was. <laughs> so we thought we might make up a party from the parish and go to Rome. Daisy has a friend living in Rome, said Edwin, Nelly Musgrove. They were at school together. She teaches English and feeds the stray cats in the forum. This excerpt from An Unsuitable Attachment introduces us to the St. Basil's parish, parish pilgrimage to Rome. I believe the only scene in Pym's major works set, out the, set outside the confines of London, North Oxford and Middle England. An Unsuitable Attachment is one of my favorite Pym novels and hearing of the proposed theme of the Pym Society's conference planned for 2020, I set out to recreate the pilgrimage for myself. I love walking in the steps of my favorite authors and their characters, whether it's the Venice of Donna Leon, the Haworth of the Brontes, or Trollope City of London. I asked myself whether I could recreate the St. Basil's trip, and what would I find? Would it change my perceptions or understanding of the novel? And I made it. In the summer of 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, I managed to get to Rome for five days, flying out from Heathrow and staying, sadly, not in a little pension by the Spanish steps, but in Domus Helena, a religious guest house five minutes from Santa Maria Maggiore, even more pimish, I would say. Breakfast was served by a cheery nun who I swear was wearing eyeliner. <laughs> Like our, like our parishioners, I spent a few days happily and profitably in a whirl of sightseeing. Churches were reverently admired, views exclaimed over, ruins gave rise to solemn or facetious comments, feet and backs ached in a good cause, and like Sister Jew, my ankles swelled in the unaccustomed heat. A visitor to Rome, can see and do much the same as those traveling almost 60 years ago, although the trip out would be a little different. The St. Basil's party would have traveled with British European Airways, 
which merged with British Overseas Airways Corporation in 1974 to form British Airways. By the time of their trip, flying was overtaking train travel for European trips. In fact, it was Sophia's first, first flight to Italy. In 1953, tourist fares were introduced by British European Airways, and by 1960, the world's first commercial jet airliner, the de Havilland Comet 4B, was flying passengers from London Heathrow to Leonardo da Vinci Airport in Rome. Sadly, I haven't been able to find out how much the trip would have cost. For me, flying out in 2020 and living in a society where loyalty schemes are rife, the BA flight cost just 30 pounds and several thousand Avios points. Our parishioners would not have been able to have used their co-op divvy towards a flight, I think. <laughs> the main difference is that in the early 1960s and until 1974, passengers did not always make their own way to the airport. Instead, they travelled largely via the West London Air Terminal, a check-in facility for British European Airways flights from Heathrow Airport, located on the Cromwell Road in Kensington, London, where the Sainsbury's food shop now stands. After passengers checked in their baggage and received their boarding passes, they would travel to Heathrow Airport by bus, which towed a luggage wagon. Unless, of course, they happened to be clergy, or members of religious orders. In the bus going to the airport, she looked around her to see what sort of people went to Rome in April. She was not surprised to see two or three elderly ladies and nondescript middle-aged couples. But where were all the priests and nuns she'd expected, the real glory of a flight to Rome? The idea, the answer to this question was that they had other means of transport. As the bus arrived at the airport, a shooting break drew up and a party of nuns got out of it. Now priests and even a couple of bishops appeared and Sophia felt a sense of relief, as if their presence was some sort of guarantee of a safe flight. <laughs> Unlike the parishioners, I didn't succumb to the miniature bottles of spirit on sale on the flight. Of course, I'm thinking of the bottle store for the Christmas Bazaar, said Sister Jew virtuously, tucking the little bottles into her bag. But like our travel-weary party from St Basil's, I was gasping for a cup of tea soon after arrival, so a visit to Babington's Tea Rooms was called for. In the tea room, their spirits were at once raised and depressed by the English-looking cakes pots of jam and packets of tea in the showcases. There's actually a packet of tea outside in the Pimbola, so a bit of a plug for ticket sales there. But the dim interior with its Cardoma-like decor reassured and encouraged them. The whole place suggested tea and a good cup at that. They found two adjacent tables and settled down, the men a little aloof from the women. A waitress came and took their order in broken English, though Sophia had started to speak Italian to her. I can identify with that. There are few obvious English tourists, but even more elderly Italians, and even a few young couples, as if it were the fashionable thing to do. Babington's was certainly a fashionable spot in the early 60s, Originally opened at the end of the 19th century to serve the refreshment needs of English visitors. At that time, tea was viewed as a medicinal product in Italy and could be obtained only in pharmacies. I suspect it's a bit like olive oil was here. Babington survived two world wars and flourished in the 1960s. There were strong links between the world of the cinema and Babington's. The then owner, um, was married to MGM's European director and also worked as a costumist, as did her daughter. As the official history of Babington's, published in 2018, recounts, actors shooting in Rome met up in Babington's in their spare time. There was Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, without makeup, having breakfast. Peter Eustinos came for lunch. Claudia Cardinale at tea time. Audrey Hepburn was a, sorry. <laughs> sorry. 
Audrey Hepburn was a regular client who appreciated Babington's dark chocolate cake in particular. She first started coming to the tea rooms while filming Roman Holiday and remained a faithful client after she moved permanently to Rome. Shy, she would hide behind her scarves and dark glasses and always chose a corner table. Federico Fellini, who captured this new world for all time in his 1960 masterpiece, La Dolce Vita, himself lived close by in the Piazza di Spagna and would sit quietly in the tea room sketching. Babington's is just as fashionable today with prices to match. My modest pot of tea and lunchtime salad set me back over 30 euros. Today, a pot of breakfast tea will set you back 11.5 euros, which is actually quite a lot more than say Fortnum and Mason's at St Pancras Station. But if you think 11.5 euros for a cup of tea is a lot, then actually um, you might like to note that a glass of wine, and not a very big one, will set you back 15 euros. I sense only well-heeled parishes could run to that nowadays. Although situated just a couple of minutes away from the English church, Babington's caters for a largely international crowd of well-heeled travellers, and you are more likely to hear Russian spoken than English. And actually, I had to ask for a jug of milk to accompany my tea. Other locations mentioned in the novel are much as they were in the 1960s. The Via Bottega Oscura, where Jay's school friend Nellie Musgrave's grave lives, is next to the city's principal cat sanctuary. Sadly, unlike Edwin and Daisy, I didn't see an Aberdeen Terrier, but I did drop in to visit the cats, looked after by a team of doughty, and I have to say remarkably glamorous Italian ladies. And here they are, so that's sitting next to the calendar, which um, the cat there is sitting next to the calendar, which I bought um, as my kitchen calendar for this year. Sophia and Mark stroll hand in hand by the Spanish steps and the Trinita de Monte, still a lovely spot for a walk. And the house where Keats died, which diverted Sophia, is a fascinating museum and diverted me too. Alas, the Banco di Santo Spirito is no more. It was founded by Pope Paul V in 1605, was the first national bank in Europe as the Bank of the Papal States, the first public deposit bank in Rome and the oldest continuously operating bank in Rome until its merger in 1992. My visit to St. Pe During my visit to St. Peter's, I found it nigh deserted. Unlike my visit the year before, when crowds of pilgrims bearing banners from churches from across the world snaked across the piazza. It was an opportunity to experience the calmness and spirituality of the mother church of all Christianity. For our parishioners though, it was a somewhat mixed experience. It had been decided that the morning should be spent visiting St. Peter's and the Vatican. For whatever one, for whatever one did, um, one must see that. Ruins were more easily glossed over. One church or one fountain could be confused with another, but St. Peter's was not to be so easily disposed of. <laughs> Sophia had visited the Basilica several times before, as one might say, thought nothing of it but Mark was all, always impressed and he was overawed. It did not give him the same comfortable feeling as seeing the hurrying priests at the airport had done. He tried to think of Canterbury Cathedral as being perhaps the nearest Anglican equivalent. Penelope hadn't really wanted to come to St. Peter's though she felt she ought to see it. When they saw St. Peter's foot, worn away by the devotion of countless pilgrims. As you can see, I got very close to the statue. There were no countless pilgrims really when I was there. She had a superstitious desire to kiss it, 
as if doing so could bring her good luck. But when the moment came, she couldn't do it. She became fiercely hygienic and Protestant and held back. How can they, she whispered to Ianthe, then realised that a young Italian was pressing too close to her and sprang away in horror, both at this episode and the whole idea of kissing the foot. Ianthe's feelings were as mixed as those of the rest of the party. She had dutifully read up something about St. Peter's, but a guidebook springs to life in unexpected ways. And now she found herself wondering what John's comments would have been. Would it be possible to go around sightseeing with him and expect him to say the sort of things appropriate to the occasion? But perhaps if they were to have any kind of life together, none of it or very little would be spent looking at churches and picture galleries, so it wouldn't matter. I suppose you'd say the church was a vicar of St. Peter's in a manner of speaking, declared Sister Jew, bringing everybody's thoughts back to the matter in hand. I wonder what the lady workers here use to keep all that marble clean. Our intrepid parishioners naturally visited the Trevi Fountain, where Anita Eckbird, Eckbird famously splashes in Fellini's 1960 film, La Dolce Vita. This gives them an opportunity to ponder their hopes and fears for the future. It was much the same for me, actually, as I threw in my coins. It was dark by the time the party arrived at the Trevi Fountain after dinner. The evening sky was a bright electric blue, and against it, the fountain reared itself monument monumentally like scenery in an opera. Yet nothing dramatic was to be expected of this cast. Sophia thought, and there was no sign of Father Branch. Perhaps we shouldn't wait for him to throw in our coin, said Mark, rather as if he were organising the children on a parish outing. It's rather cold standing about. I know what I'm going to wish for, said Sister Jew, advancing dangerously near the water, as if about to fling herself in amongst the straining, rearing horses. Mark explained that, strictly speaking, the legend was if you threw in a coin into the fountain, you would ensure your return to Rome. I feel that should be enough without any other wish, said Sophia. But privately, privately, she added a kind of prayer that Faustina might be safe and happy. Mark also threw in a coin because he did not want to seem superior by refusing to make a fool of himself. And Edwin did the same to human women. Daisy frowned as she threw hers, as if she hardly wished to return to a country where animals were not treated as they should be. Now, you mustn't tell anyone what you wish, said Sister Jude to Ianthe and Penelope, for obviously the two younger unmarried women would have the most interesting and secret wishes. She herself wanted nothing in the romantic line, just that one of her numbers should come up on Ernie. Premium bonds, that is, she added, in case the spirit of the fountain didn't know what she meant. <laughs> you go next, said Penelope to Ianthe, for she had a childish feeling that it would be lucky to be last. Oh, all right, Ianthe laughed, but inwardly she felt quite serious. That I may return to Rome with the man I love, she said to herself, and quickly threw her coin into the water. A visit to swinging Trastevere, still somewhat edgy to this day by some of the party, is the final major scene of the Rome trip. My lunchtime visit followed a visit to the beautiful Palazzo Vanessina, which was somewhat eventful. I just had a pizza and a beer to fortify me. Pim masterfully uses the restaurant visit to flesh out the characters, portraying Penelope as a young, vibrant, modern woman. I am, and Ianthe as a traditional English gentlewoman. We see this through Rupert Stonebird's anthropologist's eye. Penelope looked attractive in an outlandish sort of way, in a black skirt and orange velvet top. She wore no jewellery and her lips were pale, although her eyes seemed to be heavily made up. The heavy scent she wore tantalised him because it was one he knew but he could not remember. Its name, whether it was an evocative French phrase or a downright English word like carpet or swamp. He wondered if Basil Branch knew, 
then decided that a celibate priest, or at least not an English one, would probably not know such things. Ianthe was in flowered silk with pearls. She smelt rather faintly of lily of the valley and was in a mood to match the sweetness of that flower, smiling and finding everything delightful. It is here that we finally get a tantalizing glimpse of the Rome of La Dolce Vita. As our parishioners, parishioners enter the apparently fashionable restaurant that had been recommended to them. They were shown to a table in an inner room by a wall covered with signed photographs of celebrities of some kind, with an occasional face almost recognizable among so many flashing sets of teeth and gleaming waves of hair. I won't repeat the story of the publication of an unsuitable attachment some 20 years after it was written, as you will all be familiar with the story of the wilderness years. I've asked myself why Pym took the decision to base an extended scene in Rome. Rome clearly evoked happy memories for her. She was there as a wren in World War II, just three months before VE Day, when she described Rome itself, wide pavements, magic twilight, as I first saw Berlin in 1938. Trees coming to leaf in the, in the streets, flower shops full of fruit blossom and other more exotic things, St. Peter's, vast and unchurch-like, marble in various covers, nice holy water basins, white cherubs and yellow sienna marble. It was Palm Sunday and outside they were selling palms and little palm crosses and everyone carried springs of myrtle. All the pictures behind the altars were veiled in purple. She visited again in 1961 to attend an anthropological conference whilst in the middle of writing the novel. Clearly lots of what she saw and heard made its way into the book. After the Lugard lecture, we went to a cocktail party at the Grottanelli's flat, high up in a rather squalid building in Lago Arenula. Crossing over the square, we went underground and saw the thin cats, mostly grey, tabby or tortoiseshell, which are said to be fed by elderly ladies. This is the cat sanctuary I visited. She also describes in her diaries her first glimpse of the Spanish steps masked with red, pink and white azaleas. On a side trip to Amalfi and Ravello, she describes the little bundles of dried lemon leaves which you unwrap to reveal a few delicious lemon scented raisins in the middle. That appears in an unsuitable attachment too. After my talk, we'll be auctioning off Barbara's copy of Roman Itineraries, a promotional guidebook produced by the Rome Tourist Office for the Rome Olympics and presumably given to Barbara on the trip. This beautifully illustrated book describes the sites in a somewhat quirky translated form. She marked her name and date inside. Clearly, it was an important book to her and worth keeping. And inside, I found a press cutting called simply Cemetery and Tea Room, describing an anonymous journalist day in Rome, visiting the graves of Shelley and Keats in the English cemetery. Why didn't the St. Basil's party visit there, I asked myself, followed by tea at Babington's. After an hour with the English dead, what could I do but rush to Babington's English tea rooms, where in company with melancholy looking English, elderly English women, I drank Earl Grey tea, another plug for the pimbola outside, and ate scones, anchovy toast, etc., etc. Finally staggering out with indigestion caused not so much by overeating as by sheer nostalgia. It isn't clear when this article was published, but from the typeface, I think this is sometime after her 1961 trip, maybe in the wilderness years in the 1970s. Perhaps she tucked this inside Roman itineraries, intending to use it as part of her revision of an unsuitable attachment. I love the Rome scenes in the novel and undertaking my own literary pilgrimage in the footsteps at St. Basil's, they've always struck me as being something of a distraction, but in a positive sense. 
I felt as though I've been whisked away from post-war London to a sunnier place where people and relationships could change within days. Philip Larkin had a mixed opinion in a somewhat diplomatically worded letter to Pym, quoted in a lot to ask, he said, the excursion to Rome is good and I think successful, but I hope you won't repeat the experiment too often, as I think one of your chief talents is for recording the English scene. I'd initially considered the choice of the trip to Rome as an attempt by Pym to popularise and update the novel, making it fresh for readers in the 60s and essentially making it a little bit more swinging and a bit less cosy. This would be similar to her including a young mother as a principal character in an academic question set in 1970 in a modern provincial university and not um, altogether successfully in my view. Or maybe it was just a desire to reflect the current social context. After all, Rome was then the most fashionable place on the planet. The Rome Olympics of 1960 was arguably the first modern Olympics and had extensive coverage in the media of the time all over the world. The budget was more than double that of the previous games and the TV coverage was extensive. And in fact, the first Paralympic games were held then. Italian cinema was on a high with the films of Fellini and others um, giving audiences worldwide a glimpse of the Dolce Vita. Just being Italian was considered glamorous and exciting. And it certainly worked when my mother and father married in the early 60s. When Pym was writing, I'm sure she would have been aware of two bestsellers. In 1959, best-selling travel writer H.V. Morton published This Is Rome, a pilgrimage in words and pictures that sold remarkably well worldwide. In this, he accompanies an elderly a celebrity American priest called Fulton J. Sheen, who apparently is on his way to sainthood, and the priest's young nephew called Jerry. It's an extraordinary book with evocative descriptions of the sites and their religious significance, illustrated with somewhat cheesy photographs. It's very much a book of its time. In the same year, Elizabeth Bowen published A Time in Rome an account of a stay of several months in the Eternal City. Bowen's book is hard to describe. It's part memoir, part travel guide, and part reflection on St. Paul. For those who love her work, as I do, it's an evocative and occasionally amusing account, although frankly not much happens and you learn surprisingly little. It's now in print again. I can imagine Bowen wistfully floating round Rome of the late 50s, dressed as a smart Anglo-Irish gentlewoman, considering as objectively as an anthropologist, the sights and sounds of the city as she flits from one church to another. The work I'm sure must have inspired Pym. She knew Bowen having first met her at a publisher's party as described in A Lot to Learn. Elizabeth Bowen in black with gray and white pearls and pretty earrings, little diamond balls. The young author in her nervousness talks rather too much about herself. E.B. discusses methods of working, better at a typewriter than curled up in an armchair. She's very kind and obviously feels she ought to know more about me than she can possibly know. Her stammer is not really as bad as I'd expected. And indeed, an unsuitable, and indeed, in an unsuitable attachment, Ianthe muses on Bowen heroines. She saw herself perhaps a, as an Elizabeth Bowen heroine, for one did not openly identify oneself with Jane Austen heroines, and To the North was her favourite novel. To the North, written in 1932, is a poignant novel, not much happens, but what does is described with great sensitivity and the descriptions are vivid. The ending is chilling. It's the story of two sisters-in-law, the recently widowed Cecilia and Emmeline, who co-owns a travel agency in Bloomsbury, sharing pokey offices with a learned archaeological society. Very pivish. Traveling back from Milan, Cecilia meets a young man called Marky, who later has a relationship with Emmeline. The novel begins with a vivid description of two travelers about to return home. Towards the end of April, 
A breath from the north blew, blew cold down Milan platforms to meet the returning traveller. Uncertain thoughts of home filled the station restaurant where the English sat lunching uneasily facing the clock. We gradually realise what an unsuitable attachment it is. Marky is at best a cad and potentially a psychopath. So why does Pym make this reference? Possibly she expected her well-read readers to empathise with Ianthe's predicament. Could John, the unsuitable attachment, be another Marky? For me, it seems, it seems easier to see the Rome visit as an homage to Pym's um, to Elizabeth von Arman's Enchanted April, as described beautifully in Paula Byrne's biography. In homage to Elizabeth von Arman's The Enchanted April, the action moves from cold, grim London to Italy. In Arman's novel, Italy is a magical place where cold marriages are rejuvenated and love affairs are kindled. Likewise, Mark and Sophia drew closer together not only because of the key to the sun and the glories of Rome, but because for once, Mark is not sharing his wife with Faustina. In an Italian garden, Rupert kisses Penelope. Ianthe and Sophia take a trip to Ravello to visit Sophia's aunt. Ianthe is bewitched by the setting. It's lovely, she says. It reminds me of the enchanted April, Wisteria and the Roses. So what are my conclusions on Pym's experiment? Did recreating the parish visit change my opinion of the novel? After my visit and my subsequent research, I actually found the Rome scenes in the novel to be actually more meaningful, helping to set the context for the rest of the novel, especially in terms of the unsuitable attachment. Through walking in the footsteps of the parishioners, I softened their situations and experiences and actually felt more convinced that Ianthe has made the right choice after all. And although not strictly speaking relevant to the talk, I couldn't resist sharing this photograph of these lovely nuns that I met in a department store who seemed to be um, um, shopping for athleisure. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the context was, but it's the sort of thing that you only get in Rome. So thank you very much. So much, Lucia. Lucia always comes up with something out of the ordinary and of very high quality. I must say, I, I've got a question for you before we start asking mm. you other questions. Well, a, a, a person in this room who shall remain nameless told me that in Rome you can buy calendars uh, containing pictures of good looking priests. You can indeed. I have to, and in fact, you can get them all over Italy. Every time I go to Italy, I have to buy one for my uh, grown up daughter who insists on always having one in her shared house. So, Yay. yes, that is true. But the thing is, though, it is the same pictures every year, they just change the dates. Ah, so these priests could actually be quite old by now. They could be, but they are extraordinarily good looking. I'm so convinced that they are not real priests. <laughs> They're actually models. But... Do, you, do you want to sit down mm. for questions? Um, does anyone have a question for Lucia? I'll do the roving mic. Who's got a question? Somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Come on. There must be somebody. I think I think we, you know, we could do a little trip to Rome. That would be very easy. It would, yeah. It would be extraordinarily easy. And actually, because I now when I go to Italy, I tend to stay in religious guest houses because they are 
really good value and they're completely geared um, to the needs of groups because that's what they exist for mm -hmm. they're for pilgrimage tours um, and you know they're great places to stay mm -hmm. it's much better than staying a little than a little pension by the spanish steps because frankly it'd be really noisy nowadays well, as well so you'd be better true. off in the guest house Sandra. so will you put a sign up sheet out there <laughs> That, that comment immediately reminded the story of my brothers, um, who has a, had a, a good platonic female friend who came from Liverpool. <coughs> and they went up to visit her family and stayed in a religious guest house in Crosby. Come breakfast time, there was a shortage of eggs. Who got the egg? <laughs> Yes, and you see people getting up on their uh, little old ladies getting up and giving their seats to priests on and public transport, don't you? Must be simply, yeah. Oh, this is the it's, it's me. So thank you. Thank you for plugging so successfully <laughs> <laughs> the prizes outside. And just to the history of the packet of Babington's tea is that I bought that in Babington's when I was having a cup of tea and reading an unsuitable attachment oh, and, of it, and inside the front cover I've inscribed the date I, I, that's my book it's at home um, <laughs> but I had to make a note of the fact that I was actually there doing that and that's the history of the tea and if anybody does choose it it stays wrapped because it's very very old now <laughs> Uh, when do we want to do the... Well, I, um, should, I say, should I say that? Are we finished yeah, with yeah. questions? Any more questions? Any other questions or comments for Lucia? Um, I think something else I'd perhaps like to add is the sort of... Um, I think things that were sort of missed out, actually, because I think that um, it surprised me they didn't go to the English church um, because that would have been an obvious place to put them. And um, I make a habit of visiting English churches when I travel. Um, I went to Greece this year. I visited the St. Paul's in Athens, which uh, that day was 44 degrees and it was absolutely stifling in the church. Um, and they're fascinating places. Um, the diocese in Europe has a little bit of a struggle with things um, because they get no funding from the main church of England and they're very reliant on tourist income. So mm. it's a little bit of a plug to, you know, if you're visiting places like Athens or Rome or, or Venice, um, you know, go and visit the English church because um, they, you know, they always need visitors and they're, they, um, lots of them do concerts and things like that. So St. Paul's in Athens has basically lost virtually all their income because they can't do concerts at the moment. Um, and I, I keep in touch with um, St. George's in Venice. In fact, join them for Zoom services because I preferred their services to the UK Zoom services during lockdown. Because um, at least you can, be, you can rely on the ch churches in Europe to do a proper service, which is more than you can say about Market Harbour. Um, and um, uh, so, yeah, so it surprised me they didn't go to the English church, they didn't go to the Protestant cemetery, where there's also some more cats who um, are, um, as in the little sort of uh, press cutting, um, the Protestant uh, cemetery where you can see sort of the Keats grave, um, uh, there's also a cat um, a cat sanctuary there. Um, but interestingly, the main cat sanctuary, the one that I visited, was actually founded by English women um, in, you know, sort of in sort of probably about the same time as Babington's. Um, and now it's run by these, you know, incredibly glamorous Italian ladies. And actually the calendar, I, I should have bought the calendar with me because each month has a picture of some sort of slightly disheveled looking cat. And they've all got sort of ancient Roman names because the, the Lago Argentina is, is where um, uh, Caesar was stabbed. So, yeah, I think. Um, and so they've all got names like Cesare or Livia, um, but actually they also have on each page a photograph of that cat sponsor, which is almost always an incredibly glamorous blonde lady of a certain age. Um, 
you know, who's sort of called something like Raffaella, that was called Raffaella. So, um, you know, it's now a very different vibe, but, you know, um, you know, these institutions have survived for a very, very long time. So Babington's and the English Cat um, Sanctuary, you know, uh, you know, survived nearly a century, so. Yeah. yeah, and it has um, Jewish as well, yeah, because it yeah. Te yeah, technically it's the non Catholics, yes, yes non cemetery, because it also has Jewish That's graves right. as well, yeah. and it has, um, oh gosh, the Sicilian author who died recently. Yeah, yeah, he's buried there as well. And in fact, there was, uh, when I was there last year, um, it, it wasn't that long since he died and there were absolutely loads of flowers and things. So, you know, he's got more of a following than English romantic poets, but I suppose it was sort of COVID time. So there were hardly any overseas visitors. So I think it was mainly Italians who put flowers on the grave. <laughs> but this is right, I was standing near the wall and um, I looked around my amazement and uh, there was a, female ancestor of mine. <laughs> and I had no idea was it an ancestor. Oh, people used to go to Rome with their health tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yes, finally. If the, if, yes, there is something else. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you very much for your talks, really interesting. And one question, and I guess you um, sort of follow the footsteps of Barbara Pym, but uh, as half Italian, didn't you think it's sort of strange to have like a cup of tea when you arrived in Rome and you don't you want to have like a Prosecco or something? So it, it, as an Italian you, didn't you find these English behavior very strange or? Um, well, yes and no, because well, I'm half Italian, um, but I'm, I'm quite sort of English in habits like tea. So I always, I always take my tea bags with me everywhere I go. And I quite like a cup of tea when it's hot, but I do sort of, you know, normally go for, a spritz or something like that as well but I think it was you know with my trip I was trying to sort of get in I was trying to be a bit of a method actress with it really and trying yeah. to get into the sort of swing of things yeah. and but can you feel that your Ital Italian you sort of interfering or is it <laughs> well, so, some, sometimes the thing is that I'm not quite Italian enough <laughs> to feel Italian when I go to Italy if you see what I mean. So yeah. it, it sort of depends on how good my Italian is at the time. Um, my tongue's a bit rusty at the moment. So, um, you know, I can't have, you know, I'll have ordinary conversations, but can't have really complicated conversations. But well, about 10 years ago, when my Italian was better, you know, I could have much more detailed conversations yeah. with people and felt more Italian. But I was trying to sort of think about, you know, this is, you know, this is a particular, this is a particular trip. This is about feeling English mm -hmm. in Rome and sort of trying to feel as though you're in the pages of a book. And it's a, it's a slightly different, different thing to do. So, um, you know, sort of trying to sort of do these things, but, um, but all the time, you know, ideas were racing, you know, racing through my mind about actually, why didn't they do that this? Why didn't she describe that? And, and I do feel that, I think probably she wanted to keep the, that particular scene to be quite short. And I think because that particular, because the scene is all about moving the plot along, mm -hmm. um, that I think she was probably limited as a writer in terms of actually how much she could include in there. So some things I sound, th you know, things like, you know, English ladies feeding cats, you know, fitted in very well with the themes of the novel, having one of the guests who, ran a cattery and was concerned about animal welfare. And then, you know, the, the tea, you know, is a good one to bring in. And I think you have to have the churchy bits as well. You have to have the extended scene St. Peter's. Um, but, you know, it's all about actually what the characters thought and how they developed as a result of it and how they changed. Um, and I think certainly for me, it's that sort of, you know, that whole sort of poignant, um, 
you know, quote about Ianthe, you know, in the church, thinking about how much of her life would be spent in churches. And, you know, that sort of go, you know, those thoughts going round in her mind about, you know, the sort of match she may or may not make in the future. So. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Is that still on? Yes. I've just said thank you again. And uh, can we thank Lucia again for her fascinating talk? <laughs>